All right, welcome to another edition of Three on Three. I'm here with James, green shirt, Stacy, <laughs> Cole, knows no zip code, Pennington, and I am Danny, knows no watch that is not a Rolex, Milton. And we are here talking about the best steel sports watch of the 90s. Now there's a lot of ways to look at what that means, what is best, how do we define best? I mean, guys, I'll throw to you, how are we measuring what's a best steel sports watch of the 90s? I mean, it's pretty vague, but for me, with the watch I have, I think it's based on influence, right? Because this isn't okay. exactly what you would call a prestigious watch necessarily, but it, it, it changed an entire generation of, of watch nerds. I would say it's more of a art than a science. Sometimes you get the feeling or the vibe of a watch and it matches a decade perfectly. I That's what I would say the best of the 90s. I right? guess so. I mean, I think it's purely subjective. Whatever I say is best is probably going to be the best. So, I mean... I don't know how that works for you guys. You're off to a great start. Dan. Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, well, let's, let's get into it. I mean, we have three watches here. What makes this episode particularly special is, for the first time, I think, ever on 3 on 3, these are all of our own watches. Mm -hmm. We personally wear these. They mean something to each of us. But we also think that they have a claim to be the best steel sports watch of a decade. All right, so first up, we have Cole Pennington, who's going to tell us a little bit about his watch. This is the Omega Seamaster 300-meter Professional. It debuted in 1993 as a quartz version first, and later was updated with the automatic caliber 1120. Now you might know this watch from Golden Eye, Pierce Brosnan's famous James Bond appearance, but the legacy of the watch is much larger than that. It came to define an entire decade of horological style. This example was a graduation gift for my father, but I bet you know someone who wore this watch too. It was all over the place in the 90s. All right, Cole. Why, though, is it a 90s watch? Great question, Daniel. Let me break it down into two parts here. First, we have the cultural importance of the watch, and then sort of the credibility as a tool watch through you know, important events that happened in the 90s. 1993, a fellow named Roland Specker dove with this watch and set the record at Lake Neuchatel. It was worn by Prince William, a gift from his mother, Princess Diana. And these, these all speak to the credibility of this watch as a tool watch. So that's something that I think is often overshadowed by the cultural importance of this watch, uh, which is obviously the bottom connection. And the fact that it was plastered all over malls, billboards, everywhere you looked. Like, you could not escape this watch in the 90s. Do you think Bond defines it more than anything else? Mm, so that's the thing. I don't want to give Bond too much credibility. You're trying to shy away from Bond. Yeah, he because I think Bond in it was a big moment. Yeah. It was a huge moment, and I think that certainly propelled the watch to stardom within a certain demographic. But I don't want that to overshadow the credibility and technical prowess of the watch and the fact that I, I think whether or not Bond wore this, it would still be the watch of the 90s. Omega was also at its prime, right? Coming off a few decades of tool watch innovation. And I will say, the, the pre-Bond Seamaster this is a big leap. Like this, this is a total redesign born in the 90s. It was a moment unto its own. I think the other thing that stands out for me is like from a design standpoint, it's so deeply 90s. This one traces back, you know, into the, into the 70s directly and then into the 60s with, with Seiko. And then of course, Danny right into the mid-century. Whereas from a, an aesthetic, I think that's the flannel shirt of Swiss dive watch. It's the flannel shirt on uh, Tool Time. You remember that? Uh, Home improvement? <laughs> Home improvement, yeah, it literally. Yes, is. everyone remembers tool time. There were five channels in the 90s. So, so yeah, this is why I think this is a, a 90s watch, per se, in a way that yours is not. I mean, this is basically just a dressed up 10 Let's relax for a second. <laughs> All right, thanks, Tim Allen. All right, James, tell us about your watch. Obviously, the deck is stacked in my favor here because I have the Seiko SKX 007. It's the gateway drug of dive watches, and for those of a certain age, Watch enthusiasm at large. Born in 1996 and offered in several iterations across more than a 20 year span, the SKX 007 is a 42.5 millimeter wide steel dive watch with 200 meters of water resistance, an automatic day date movement, fantastic loom, and a design legacy that can be traced back to 1965 and Seiko's first dive watch. This one right here was my introduction to the legit sport watches, and back in the day, you could get one on your wrist for under 200 bucks, and I'd wager a lot of you did. The other guys chose great watches, for sure. But for me, the SKX 007 is the most influential steel sports watch of the 90s, and it's a model that's the taproot for an entire generation of watch nerds, myself included. All right, James, I asked Cole the same question. I'm still gonna like, be leaning on my watch as the winner here, but why is your watch, I guess, a 90s watch? 
Yeah, I would say like clearly yours would be third in the list. Um, uh, but it's an SKX 007. I mean, for me, this is the reason I'm into watches. This is something that got me into diving. It connects to my childhood. Anything that glows in the dark, I'm obsessed with. So big loom on something like this. And I, I think for an entire generation of people, this was their introduction to their first sort of like quote unquote real watch. It was affordable, it was accessible. There was enough here to be nerdy about it. They made a bunch of different versions. And then of course, even to today, you can still find them, you can still mod them endlessly, you can make them their own. I think that this watch has a legacy that started in the 90s, but an effect that put me at this table, probably put you guys yeah. here to some extent. Maybe this isn't the iconic watch of the 90s. I'm okay with that. It's easily the most influential watch made in the 90s. It transcends the 90s, I will say that. Without question. I mean, I think you even said it yourself. I mean, it, it's, it was multiple decades through which it was able to sustain popularity. Yeah, yeah, they, they only discontinued it recently and the watch that they, that they kind of put in its place isn't really a true, you know, like ISO 6425 dive watch. You don't have the loom on the, on the pip. You don't have 200 meters water resistance with the screw down crown. And, and, and as much as I think the new Seiko 5 stuff is sharp, it's not the same. This is the OG and, and it's the OG from 1996. And I think it's a great option of the three, definitely the one I would go with for, for what we're talking about, but we do need to cover the Rolex. It's a surprising choice coming from you. Uh, tell, us, <laughs> tell us about the Explorer. All right, guys, well, here's a little bit about my watch. This is the Rolex Explorer 14270, the best steel sports watch of the 1990s. Born in 1989 and lasting the entire decade, it lays the best claim for being the watch of the decade. In full 90s fashion, there's nothing vintage about it. It is full modern. Glossy dial, sapphire crystal, applied markers with white gold surrounds. This, this is the 90s. This watch, as opposed to the other two watches on the table, Actually, from the oh, it's, oh, oh, well, why don't, why, don't, why don't we see here, Mr. Stacy? It lasted for the entirety of the 1990s. It was released, manufactured in 1989 originally, sure, but that iteration is known as the blackout dial, so we can all just sort of black out and forget that that happened and start fresh in 1990, Good one. where this watch lasts for the whole entire decade. So what do we have here, 1996, mm -hmm. 1993, okay. by my math, those are less years than mine? Yeah, but I would also contend like if, if it came out in 89, it's based not, on inspiration not, from say that. 86, 84, or 1953. Like You're forgetting the rules. The rules of the game are clear. We don't remember 89. Those are your rules. We're starting in 1990. And, and honestly, this is for me, similar to what you were saying about Cole's Omega. Sure, this has mid-century roots, but this was, to my mind, Rolex really making a design shift that is indicative of the 1990s forward moving design path as opposed to looking backward. I mean, so much of the dial design on this watch is a radical departure insofar as you can be radical, radical. in a 36 millimeter steel <laughs> okay. sport watch. But if you're gonna be you know, pedantic as we all are about these things, there are a lot of differences on this watch that make it an entirely modern Rolex. And that's why I think that it's the most 90s watch that Rolex ever made and that's on this table right now. So let's have a thought exercise here. Let's have You one. put a 1016 and this watch on the table next to each other and ask someone, what's the difference between these two watches? Yeah. I think that the problem with your argument here is that the Explorer just isn't necessarily a 90s watch. The 1016 does not look different at all. So it's like saying, okay. this is a 90s watch, but it's from the, no, it was made in the 90s, but it's not born from the 90s. First of all, not different at all. It's a little bit of a... <laughs> Let, let's All right, clear. we'll drop the superlatives. And I think that your watch, too, has uh, Seamaster 300 roots, without question. In nomenclature, sure. And so I think that depending on who you ask, and if you ask me, I would say mine's the watch of the 90s, and I'm just going to ignore everything else that you say about my watch. I think that's fair. I mean, that, if, that's if the you, lawyer in If the you answer. ask someone who's wrong, that is the answer they would give you. So right. I agree with that. Okay, yeah, good. For sure. I'm glad we're in agreement. It can't be lost on this episode that these are our watches. Yeah. And so out of the context of the 90s, James, what is it about the SKX 007 that you connect to? And especially since you've modded the watch, yeah. so it's even more personal. Yeah, for sure. This time it's definitely personal. It, it kind of captures everything I want from a steel sports watch. It's freedom. It has a design legacy that goes all the way back to the really early stuff. What it gives you is this sort of loose experience of what the watch world is in front of you because you, you get a steel bracelet, you've got to learn to size it, it's got micro adjust. It was like the first time where you sit there and kind of do, you know, shake and bake the 7S26, get her going, right? <laughs> and and I, Because I think, you can't wind it. 
correct, this is not a hand windable movement, but I think it's kind of characterized by this. If I say 7S26, a lot of you know this watch for it. It may be a monster, uh, which is a kind of the, the weird cousin to this watch. You get a day date, you learn a little bit about complications, you go inside uh, after a sunny day into a dark environment and the thing's a torch on your wrist. You can jump into a pool, you can go scuba diving with it. And yeah, I just think it's, it's kind of like one unit of dive watch to get people picking up pace in the world of watch appreciation. It definitely is a gateway drug watch. Cole, yours is a watch that growing up I saw all the time. What is it that you appreciate about this watch most? Well, it's exactly that. I would say it's, it's highly personal. When it comes to, like when I look down at the watch, A, it's a gift for my dad, right? So of course there's some nostalgic sentimental value and so forth, but also kind of closed a loop. I remember going to like uh, Willowbrook Mall, Short Hills Mall, these are Northern New Jersey. Jersey, Jersey boy. Mall. Yeah, that's right and seeing these watches in the windows and on the advertisements and so forth. So you grow up seeing it, then finally you become a man at 18, right? And then this is the watch that kind of represents that transition. I wore this probably more than any other watch that I have, period. And wearability is, is really good. So this is, obviously it's from the 90s, so it predates that early 2000s big watch, big thick watch thing. So it's nice and tidy on the wrist. And I don't think there is any other watch that I can think of right away that has skeleton hands like this. So I kind of like, when you're watch spotting, which you will see this watch everywhere, Absolutely. it's just very easy to identify. Yeah. It's cool to be a part of that club, the 90s club, you know? My story or my backstory with the Explorer 14270 is different than both of yours. I feel like each of you have had your watches for a considerable amount of yeah. time. And I have not. I came to this watch through writing about this watch, wanting to learn about this watch, wanting to uncover a portion of watch history that I think has yet to sort of come to fruition in terms of collector appreciation. Uh, it's stuck in sort of no man's land between what's vintage and what's modern or what's vintage and neo vintage, neo -vintage whatever <laughs> you want to call it. But I think that this represents something of a, a lost generation of Rolex watches. And I, and I had assumed that it was just, you know, a run of the mill sort of steel Rolex. But I came to really appreciate a watch that in the basically 10 to 11 years that it existed, had something like 15 small incremental iterations. And for people like us who write about watches all the time, it's those little things that really, if you get deep into a watch, I just fell hard for this thing. I learned that in Japan, there was a TV show where the lead actor wore a 14270 on the show, which led to a huge growth in popularity of the watch in that country. Uh, to the point where Rolex, to my understanding, beefed up production of the watch. And part of the reason why it's not super collectible is there are really a lot of them mm. uh, on the market today. And I just think that maybe it's not the most 90s watch where we're from, but I think in a global perspective, you know, an argument can be made, and I'm gonna make it right now, that, that it is. And I, I like the fact that this is not something that I'm almost jaded by a former version of myself and memories of the watch, but I think that I can still come to make uh, the arguments that, that I'm making. When, when did you buy it? How long have you owned this? I've owned the watch for just about two years. Two years, okay. And that's two years of a lot of wear to the point where somehow I chipped the sapphire crystal, which is apparently is tough to do. I uh, thought that was dust and I really wanted to uh, wipe, yeah, wipe, wipe, wipe it off the whole give, time. Give it a shot. It won't, <laughs> it won't come off. So that, that's actually a plus one for our watches. I mean, I've had this for 20 years. Is it a plus one or is that, it a plus one for clarity of my argument? Clarity of mind. Well, I mean, chipping the crystal. Oh, and, and oh, then, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> and then ours I are see. in pretty good nick for yeah. having been around since we were like high school, college age. Yeah. I, mean. I got this one uh, in 2007. It has like personal sentimental value. It has like experiential value to me. And I think that's like something you build into a watch regardless of the watch. Uh, but you can definitely see it in Cole's watch as well. And Danny, you know, give this one a few more years. I think you'll get there. You might want to do something about that chip. Is it character? Can we, can we, can I get like a, a call on this one? It's, it's triggering me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I keep on It's just that. small <laughs> enough, right? <laughs> Let's get into the design of the watch. I mean, for me, the Explorer is, I will take a little bit from Cole. There is some mid-century heritage going on in this watch that I do appreciate. But for the most part, what I love about the 14270 versus a 1016 is that it doesn't scream vintage at my face. Mm. There is a stylized look to the numerals that have lasted through different iterations of the Explorer, different reference numbers that are not this one, that continue to this day. So they're so modern and contemporary that 
I think they were almost futuristic in 1990. I love to be able to wear a watch that feels a bit vintage, a bit rattlesnake, but looks super modern. So my, my question is, is the font of the numerals the same today as it was in the 90s, making it a 1990 to 2022 watch? I would say that it is the same. Uh, obviously there's like small differences. Yeah. But then I would answer you with, no, it does not make it a watch of the 2000s. It makes the current models reimaginations of the 90s original. So right. you're saying- Much like yours is a reimagination of a 50s original. Exactly. You know what? And All yours right. is a before, before, of a before, before we go too far down this road, Cole, tell me about the design of the Seamaster. Well, I can just maintain what I want to maintain All right. about And I will watch. say like, since we're, we're looking at it in the framing of the 90s, the scallops bezel is awful to use. You cannot grab this thing, like literally. You can kind of turn it, right? Yeah. Sword hands, just kind of weird. This isn't winning any design awards. It's a lot like like chains. We, we know that the Berettas from the 90s, the kind yeah, of the sure. oddball cars that came in the 90s, the oddball fashion. Like it wasn't necessarily good, but it was very of its time. Functionally, like the whole point is to use the bezel, right? You can't do it. And also the helium escape valve. Yeah. An entirely necessary contraption, right? It's, it's a total gimmick. Um, Coming from a guy who has gone on saturation dives. Well, that was a saturation light bat. Okay. And, and also like, you you wouldn't need this ever, actually. This is a kind of a marketing shtick and it's become so tied up with the identity of the watch that it you know has lived on. It's not a beautiful design or balanced design like the 1016. And, and so forth. Speak the <laughs> but, name of my reference, Cole. <laughs> like the 14270. Thank However, you. I think it's very of its time and I appreciate it for that. All right, James, how about the SKX? The SKX is very much like, there's no add-ons here. There's no, you don't get the HEV valve. They didn't put anything on here you didn't need. Arguably, maybe day is a little fancy, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of fancy. In a different language, though, that's cool. Yeah, and you like, can, you can, can kind of right. can toggle it between, yeah. which is kind of fun. I think from a design standpoint, you know, the, this one doesn't do a lot of its own heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. It's pulling on 6309s, 6105s. Like, this is a, a watch that's very referential to its own past, very Japanese in its thinking, and very straightforward as far as what it does. It shows you the time as brightly and as clearly as possible. Uh, the bezel is great to use, super easy, even now. Um, Pretty quiet. Yeah, not too loud. I mean, th I've, this thing's popped off before. It's, it's, it's been through a couple bumps and, and the rest. And, and otherwise, this is just kind of a watch that demands very little of you. Put it on and wear it. Keep it alive on your wrist. Uh, put it on your nightstand. It's better than an alarm clock uh, in the middle of the night. And I, I think as far as the design goes, it's like, uh, it's, it's almost as elemental as what the Explorer comes from. Like, this is the look of a Japanese dive watch. Cole, you've got yours on kind of a unique strap scenario yeah. because your bracelet exploded. Yeah. Uh, your words, not mine. I, obviously, you still wear this watch. Like, what? How, does, yeah, it, how does it wear for you? How does it compare to what other watches you wear? Now, I know you also famously wear Pepsi GMT. I got used to the level of comfort right out of the gate, right? Like this, which has a compact form factor on the wrist, is not very So nice tall. and thin. It, it is. Yeah. It's thin. That's the thing about it, right? Yeah. So 1120, the movement inside neatly packed into a compact case. Then I moved into like the vintage, funky, micro. Early 2000 micros, you know, they can be brickish on the wrist. Yeah. Finally came back around in my advanced age to kind of prefer something very comfortable. I had a 2254, which is a sibling yeah, to this with the great. sword hands, the black dials. Oh, yeah. Ergonomically, like for a watch that, uh, that was sized to be a large watch in its era, it, so they wear so well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, James, what is the wear experience of an SKX? Like, do you still wear them? Absolutely, yeah. I think for a watch of its size, and these days it's pretty popular to like not be wild about 42 and a half millimeters. This is like 13, 14 millimeters thick. Uh, I think it's about 47 millimeters lug to lug. The only thing that I, I wish I, they did was drilled lugs. Yeah. But if you actually see how thick the lugs are, that'd be quite a hole to try and get the tool all the way in. And the truth is the tolerance of them, the bracelet are so kind of, let's say, 90s uh, that um, you can almost take it off with a, with a sharp enough fingernail, like you don't even need a tool. Uh, the bracelet's kind of hilarious, uh, like I said, from a wearability standpoint, but otherwise, like, it's not too big, it's not too small. And then for, for those of you listening that you go, there's no way I would wear a 42.5 millimeter dive watch, the SKX-013 is the 37 millimeter right. version of the same watch. And the kind of cool thing is, is you can go in a bunch of different directions and get the same style. Mm. Uh, there's a ton of these out there. Obviously the, the 007 normally has a black bezel. This one's modded, but then the 009s with the blue red. Yeah. Super wearable, really casual. 
And the other thing that's great, and this is obviously to my preference because I'm not a huge bracelet guy, as hilarious as this one is, it's great on anything. It came with a decent rubber. You can upgrade that rubber. You could go leather. I wore it on a NATO for years. Just a really flexible, easy wearing dive watch that um, I, I think is stylish, but not in any way that's even remotely flashy, which kind of works for me. What about you? This We're going to get blown like, out of the water. This, yeah, this like, is talk about wearable. For Danny, though. Yeah, yeah. For me, I don't think oh, so. Oh, I love it. I've talked to you about this before. I've only had it for two years, but when I see this sort of next to my other watches, I gravitate toward this watch almost every time I pick it up because when you put it on, it's so it's so light, first of all, and on the wrist, it, it honestly just like disappears a little bit. So unassuming as well, it's, for a Rolex even. I, I think that's right. And, and the Oyster bracelet's one of my favorite things that Rolex does, period. Especially the older models, pre the more technically advanced clasp system. Despite the fact that there's no, you know, easy link adjustment systems, I just like how light they are and how good they look. And this being, you know, no functional bezel, just all stainless steel, everything, but at a 36 millimeter size. I forget that I'm wearing it sometimes and other people don't know that this is a Rolex most of the time. You know, it has sort of like a Seiko 5 look from a distance if mm. you're really not, you know, paying attention. And I, I love that, to be able to have a watch like this, but not really have the attention that you don't want sometimes with a luxury watch. It makes me, you know, feel good to wear it. The other thing to, to consider when we're looking at these three, and I'm setting myself up for a little bit of a failure here, but okay. is the movements. Yeah. Right, because yours is at a base decorated and, and modified, right, yeah. and a solid movement for sure. Yeah, and yours, of course, is a Rolex in-house movement, and Caliber mine's essentially 3, a That's right. yeah. single-cylinder lawnmower engine. They somehow fit into a dive watch. <laughs> so it's a different sort of vibe. Like the 7S26 is like widely known to be kind of loose on its timekeeping, but like it'll also never stop. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, there's a tier system here. Like I think that there's there's a case to be made that within each one of these watches, the movement. Is appropriate to it's what it is. It's appropriate to yeah. what it is. And it's what not, it cost in the day. Right. And yeah. it's not, wasn't the top shelf movements. And I think it appeals to each of us as well. This idea that it's what this watch needs and nothing more. I agree. So we should probably hit hard what we think is the most 90s about our steel sport watches, especially the one that arguably had way more decades that were not 90s in it. And when did you get this one? 2005. 2005. Okay, great. <laughs> So Cole, uh, tell us about your watch from 2005 and why it's the most 90s watch on the table. <laughs> well, that's very lawyer of you, Danny. Um, well, Especially for a fellow who got his watch like two years ago. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't yeah, matter, doesn't two, matter, doesn't two, matter when I got it. I remember, is it 2001 now? Doesn't matter when I got it. So yeah, I think uh, it's all about design and ethos for this yeah. watch and, and it's placed in the cultural pantheon of the 90s. It's not worth talking about tech specs, this or that, it's simply, when you think of a watch from the 90s, chances are you think of this because you probably knew someone who had one. Did you or not? I did. Okay. I'm not going to lie. There or you go. saw browsing. I don't want you to be right, but yeah, I'm not going to exactly. lie. Exactly. Yeah. For me, I'm going to just reiterate what I said from the top. In this reference, I had the whole decade. And that's it. You had the whole decade because you started before the 90s. The 1950s. I think that we've... I, 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 <laughs> look, guys, we, we, we could cut this a million different ways. <laughs> Seamaster 300. Um, you don't you don't need to respond. You're actually not allowed to respond. So Seamaster 300, and then every Seiko diver that came before it. So I think we all have watches that have a lineage from the 50s and 60s that come through our watch. But I will say, if we're just talking about individual reference numbers, mine had the entirety of the decade. James, on to you. All right. So. Uh... I have to give Cole the hat tip for design. This isn't a 90s design, but in a matter of influence, I think this is kind of like a band that started earlier, but their best album came out in the 90s. <laughs> and within that context, I think the dream of the 90s in sport watches is still very much alive in the uh, in the SKX 007. I think this is the most influential watch of that decade. And I don't really want to be unfair in just blowing you guys out of the water, but... <laughs> <laughs> what watch got you guys into watches? Yeah, I mean, if if I didn't pick this watch, it would be this one, and and I don't. And Danny, I'm pretty sure you own one of these guys, right? I, I do own one. And have you had it had it longer than your closer to the '90s in terms of a time frame than than this this here? You may not get this reference, James, but I plead the fifth. <laughs> yeah, we don't have that where I'm from. <laughs> Could you imagine it not picking a Rolex for this though? I think, like I said at the top, I can't imagine not picking a Rolex for anything. All right. Well, yeah. I, I, I do think these are the, are the three, though, for, within the context. I, th I think that's right. And, and this argument can honestly last forever. And I think what makes this episode different, what makes these watches special, is they're our watches. And whether or not they're 90s watches, we're 90s kids. Yeah. And I think that the debate should be left open you know, to the audience, to the viewer, to the commenter. 
And so please let us know which watch you think is the most 90s. I won't be upset if you don't pick mine. Thanks for watching this episode of Three on Three. For James, for Cole, I'm Danny. We'll see you next time.